we're excited to announce that Nomad 1.6 is now generally available. We're releasing some new updates to improve security and usability with Nomad, including UX updates and node pool governance, which allows you to tie Nomad namespaces to nodes. I'm in the studio with Mike, who works here at HashiCorp on the product management team overseeing Nomad. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks, Jordan. I'm really excited to be here and talk about some of the changes that we've been working on on Nomad 1.6. But before we jump into those new changes and releases, could you just take a moment to explain what Nomad is for everyone um, who may be new to it? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm happy to. Uh, Nomad is HashiCorp's application orchestrator or scheduler. And the guiding principle behind Nomad is that it should be able to orchestrate any application anywhere. That could mean containers running in a cloud environment, virtual machines running on-prem, or even raw binaries on edge devices. So Nomad is a single tool that manages all of these workloads on whatever machines they're running on. So when people say schedule or orchestrate, that can mean a lot of different things. Would you be able to break this down a little bit? And also, why would an organization care about scheduling? Yeah, so let's start with how Nomad works. So first you have a bunch of compute that you wanna use, virtual instances in the cloud, bare metal servers, et cetera, um, and you run a Nomad agent on them. And this transforms these separate individual server nodes into a single unit that we'll call a Nomad cluster. And we'll call each node in the cluster a Nomad client. And Nomad clients are where you actually run your workloads or applications. And so one of the first benefits you'll see is that Nomad gives you a unified interface uh, for interacting with any application on these clients. You write a declarative file called a job, you hand it to Nomad, and Nomad will figure out which client to put the workload on. So I could submit a job that says run this Docker image, another that says run this Java jar, run this VM, and Nomad will place these applications on the right nodes and isolate them from one another. The next benefit is that Nomad keeps these jobs healthy and available. If an application instance dies for some reason, or if a portion of your cluster gets wiped out, Nomad will automatically detect that some applications aren't running and then bring up new versions running on different nodes. So Nomad keeps your applications healthy and up and running. And this applies to app changes as well. So if you change code, you just send a new job to Nomad telling it that, hey, there were some updates and Nomad can safely roll out these changes across your whole cluster. Additionally, Nomad helps you get the most out of your resources. So you can configure Nomad to do things like spread out all the applications across the client nodes and maximize resilience. Or if you're cost conscious, you can configure Nomad to automatically pack applications together, making it easier to cut costs on compute that you aren't using. And then lastly, since Nomad provides a layer of abstraction between the underlying hardware and the applications running on it, it becomes easy to scale up your compute or application count, or even completely re-platform onto different hardware while maintaining the same workflow. It's great to see the power of Nomad, and that was also a great walkthrough of how Nomad works. And so we know that a lot of companies, they're using Nomad to keep their application scheduling reliable. And one customer that's using Nomad is Roblox. Would you be able to cover why they specifically chose Nomad? Yeah, I think Roblox is a really great example of a customer maximizing their use of Nomad. So let's talk about why they chose Nomad. So first, the most obvious reason to me is scale. Roblox is one of the most popular online games with over 60 million daily active users, and they manage a ton of servers to handle all that traffic. And Nomad's the only orchestrator that's able to scale to meet those needs. Next, they needed flexibility. Being a gaming company, they had workloads that ran on Windows, but then they also had classic Linux servers and devs running Mac OS. And Nomad is able to run on all of these platforms natively. Then lastly, they needed simplicity. Roblox is hugely popular, and when they decided on Orchestrator, they expected their player count to scale massively, but they didn't want their SRE and ops costs to scale just as much. So they chose Nomad as it allowed them to keep their ops overhead low, even with a huge number of servers. And speaking of scale and simplicity, I understand that your team has introduced some new features to make Nomad simpler to scale. Yeah, and in Nomad 1.6, we're introducing a new concept called node pools. A node pool is just a named collection of nodes. So job submitters can specify which node pool to deploy to, and then their workloads are deployed only to those client nodes. 
And then we've also had this feature called constraints for some time. But constraints force you to opt out of certain client nodes. So if I want to avoid some clients, all of my jobs have to specify, hey, avoid these machines. This becomes a challenge as every part of your organization now has to know about which nodes they need to avoid. With node pools, uh, you can just avoid all of that overhead and have things automatically go to the right node. And so with Nomad Enterprise, node pools then gives you some additional governance controls, right? Yeah, the, the challenge we're trying to solve with node pool governance is how do I use Nomad with multiple teams? And when you have this challenge, ideally you have a central platform team that can set policy controls such as what can be run on specific nodes and who can run uh, workloads there. Additionally, different teams might have different scheduling needs. Scheduling rules that you use for on-prem nodes might be different from scheduling rules used for cloud nodes. And we've spoken to a lot of Nomad users and users of other orchestrators who've had these challenges, and they end up just splitting into multiple clusters. So if they have five teams using their orchestrator, they end up with five separate orchestrator clusters. But that's really not ideal. You can manage multiple clusters, but you shouldn't have to just to handle multi-tenancy. So we've solved this problem with node pool governance, since you can tie Nomad namespaces to node pools. Using namespaces, you can separate teams of users. And now with node pool governance, you can ensure that two namespaces don't share the same node pool. And beyond that, node pools um, can be configured to use different scheduling algorithms and have different memory over subscription values. Altogether, this allows multiple teams to share a cluster and not have to worry about workloads or scheduling rules clashing with one another. So I know that there are some new UI updates that developers will notice in the new 1.6 version. Yeah, so there are a lot of reasons that developers come to the UI, and in 1.6, we wanted to focus on a few of them. Firstly, how does a user know if a job is healthy? And more importantly, should they intervene if it's not healthy? And then also, how does a user know that a job is doing uh, what it should be doing? How is it configured? And so to address the first issue, Nomad now makes it easier than ever to understand the state of your job with the new job UI. Is the job healthy? How many allocations are running? What's the status of a deploy? What events just happened? All of this information is readily available at a glance. You should be able to just look at the new job page and immediately know if you have to take corrective action or if your job is healthy. And then additionally, we've added no Nomad job specs right into the UI. Previously, users would have to go and reference their Git repos to figure out exactly how a job was configured. And now you could just look right at the file submitted by the user and see how a job was defined. This makes it a lot easier to understand what's in a job, debug new jobs as you're writing them, or in the case of a prod emergency, you can edit your jobs and resubmit them right from the UI. Well, I think after covering all of that, it'd be great to see some of these new features working in action. Would you be able to give us a demo showing us how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So I will uh, just quickly take you through how to serve multiple teams on a single cluster using Nomad node pools. So coming here to a cluster that I've set up, uh, let's look at this cluster. We have an AWS data center and a GCP data center. So this is a multi-cloud cluster. And we have two node pools that stretch across these data centers. We have our default node pool. So we have two clients in each data center with default. And then we also have our GPU node pool. And now as the Nomad administrator, I might want these nodes to be used for different teams. So let's imagine I have two different teams. I have an apps team and a machine learning team. And usually in Nomad, when you have two different teams using a cluster, you make namespaces. So I've done just that. I have the apps team and the machine learning uh, team with different namespaces. So let's look at if we wanted the apps team only to deploy to the default uh, node pool, how would we configure their namespace to allow for that? So I'm gonna open up my code editor. I go to the namespace configuration file. And if we look at this new nomad pool config block, I've said that the default node pool is the default node pool. And then I've denied access to the GPU nodes. So if I am working from the application namespace, there's no possible way that I could place a workload onto the GPU nodes. So let's see what happens when I try to do that. I'm writing a new job now. So imagine I'm on the apps team and I'm writing this job app server and I'm putting in the apps namespace. Now in previous versions of Nomad, what I have to do is I have to write a constraint that looks something like this. I'd have to say, hey, if the node class is GPU, don't allow any placement onto that. 
And then I would, if I had a complex cluster, I might have to write multiple constraints to avoid multiple different types of nodes. With node pools, I can just delete this code. And because of the way that I've configured my app's namespace, I just submit this and the job goes to the right place. So let's see this in action. So I open up my terminal and now I say nomad run app server. This now deploys and we'll bring back up nomad. I look at my jobs, the app server is now running. And if I look at the topology page, we see that we're in the default node pool and our jobs have been automatically placed onto the default node pool. So now these allocations are spread over these four different clients. And if we look at our GPU nodes, we have nothing there, which is exactly what we expect. So now what would happen if I'm on the apps team and I now try to use the GPU nodes? So let's go into the app server job definition. So this is using the new job spec in the UI and I can edit this job definition right from the UI. So I'm going to say node pool equals GPU. And because I'm on the apps team, this shouldn't be allowed. So I go to planet and it says, I get an error. I'm not allowed to deploy to these nodes. But what if I'm someone on the machine learning team? I actually do want to deploy to these nodes. And in fact, I don't even want to think about any other nodes by default. I just want to deploy to the ML nodes. So let's see what happens with one of their um, jobs. So I'm going to deploy something from the terminal. I'm actually going to deploy four different jobs and we'll look at them in a second. So I've deployed these four different jobs. I'll refresh my jobs page. These are now running. And if we go to the topology view, we can see that these are all placed into this node pool. So they're all running on the GPU nodes. None of them are running on the default. Now you can see something kind of interesting here. These four different jobs have all been placed onto the same client. Why is that? And so in this scenario, I'm imagining that these GPU nodes are really expensive. They're more expensive than the default and I wanna minimize my usage as much as possible. So what I've done is for the machine learning team specifically, I've said that their scheduling algorithm on the GPU nodes is bin pack. And this says that if possible, I should try to pack as many nodes on one client, uh, pack as many as possible onto one client. So in the future, I can maybe stop paying for these two clients. I can cut my cloud bill and cut my overall footprint. Um, but for the apps team, they are still spread out because we wanna optimize for high availability and resiliency for the apps team. And so while we're here in the UI, let's take a look at some of the new changes that have uh, come to the jobs page. So let's open up that app server job again. So if you're familiar with the Nomad UI, this change should be immediately obvious. Uh, this visual is now very different. So we used to show the historical information about a job here. And this was a little bit of an issue because if you had jobs that failed, let's say two months ago, you might be seeing a lot of red that, saying, that said, hey, there was some failure with this job. And so that could cause some uh, Nomad operators to get worried, have to go debug their job, when really in the current state, it was healthy. So what we've done is we've changed the UI to only reflect the current state. It should be very obvious that this job is healthy. It should be clear that you know eight allocations are running, eight allocations are exp expected to be running. And if you see red, there's a problem. If you don't see red, everything's okay. We also show information about how often the current version has be been rescheduled and what version's running. So I'm also gonna go in and make a change to this job and we'll see some more UI uh, differences that have come recently. So I'm going to double the count of this job. I'll change its memory. And then I'll also come down here and I'll tell Nomad to only roll out one of these, uh, one instance of this job at a time. So one allocation is gonna be placed at a time. Let's see what happens. So I go to planet, it's successful. And then I go to deploy. And now we have this new deployment UI that should be much more intuitive. So here we can see that there are eight instances of, instances of this job being rolled out. The previous versions are still running until these health checks pass. We now have health check information right in the UI, and we can now see it rolling out one version of the job at a time and replacing the old instances. We also have information about task events, and this is filterable, so we could look into every single allocation and see what's happening on every allocation. And then we also have update parameters. So you could see what are the rules that govern how this deployment should behave. And our goal here and our goal with all of the UI changes in Nomad 1.6 is new developers should be able to come into the Nomad UI, understand what's going on without referencing the documentation, 
and they should also have a lot of confidence. If a job is healthy, they should know it. If they need to intervene in a job and make changes, it should be immediately obvious. And we think with all the changes in Nomad 1.6, we've done just that. Well, that was great, Mike. Thanks so much for the great demo. And I totally agree with you about the UI improvements. Is there anything else that we should let the developers know about the 1.6 release? Yeah, there's even more that we couldn't cover in depth today. This includes the latest release of Nomad Pack, our templating and packaging tool, a production grade Podman driver, JWT based logins for machine to machine auth, and a single command to restart and reschedule all the allocations from a job, and a lot more. But we can't go into all of that today, so I encourage everybody to check it out themselves. If you're already a Nomad user, we think that these changes and updates will make Nomad even simpler to use and allow you to get more out of each cluster. And if you're not a Nomad user, there's never been a better time to check it out if you want a flexible, performant, and simple orchestrator. Head to the link on the screen to get started. Great, Mike. Thanks so much for coming out today. Thanks for having me, Jordan.